Adventures of Hurry Man. We're jumping right into the action today. Henderson and a couple of uniform cops are in a shootout with two bad guys. Got the cord, Inspector. Thanks to get down. Henderson also has the world's worst perimeter security. They'll let anybody drive into an active gun battle. I just hope nobody gives Perry a gun. He might hurt somebody. Most likely himself. They're a mean pair, Kent. I'd say they'd try anything to get even. Don't worry, Inspector. I've been threatened before. In fact, I go looking for it like I'm doing now. Tear gas drives one of them out. You too, Curtis. Are you going to take him alive? We'd better. He's a key man. And we've got to find out how they're operating. I don't know how many valuable secrets he's wormed out of our top businessmen. And I have a feeling he can lead us to the missing victims. World's worst perimeter security and world's most observant cops. Somebody, please come up with an appropriate award to give this department for their excessive professionalism. I'll pin the best one. Just remember, keep it clean. The guy in the shack lights a stick of dynamite and is going to throw it at the police. The explosion didn't throw him up into the air, but the oil gusher that followed did. With both bad guys caught, Clark is back standing with the group. Lieutenant, I made the deal. I'll spill it. We got no choice, Kent. We're caught. Give him the money. Money? What money? What are you talking about? Now, don't try to clam up on me. You know where the money is. They'll find out you've been working with us sooner or later. A little searching produces the money in Clark's glove compartment. Henderson will arrest him and nobody will think about the fact that Foster was standing right next to the car in the glove compartment unattended for a while. No, the only possible explanation is, well, nobody has an explanation. Later, Perry has bailed Clark out of jail. Clark has a plan. If you can't figure it out from the name of the episode, listen closely. Fire me. That's right, fire me. Loudly, firmly, and lay it on thick. Fire you? But what about your friends? Why, Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane would be broken-hearted. I know, Chief, and I'm sorry about them, but we can't take a chance on them making an inadvertent slip and giving the whole show away. No, I think we'd better start planting the idea in their heads right now. Okay. Perry accidentally leaves his intercom on, so Lois and Jimmy hear him call Clark everything but a bipedal hominid and fire him. From there, it's on to Henderson's office to begin the show for the guests of honor. We had to allow bail for your new friend, so we set it so high they couldn't make it, we thought. But a man named Jason met the amount a few minutes ago. Looks like you fellas have a big organization. What are you doing, pal? Planning state's evidence? Oh, very funny. I know you're framing, and you know it too, but nobody else will believe it. In reality, they made sure Curtis and Foster's bail was low enough that almost anybody could cover it. Clark makes a show of not being able to find a job, and Henderson says, just stay in town and keep your noses clean, all of you. Clark storms out. You mean you don't wear a suit and tie to relax at home? <clears throat> Come in. This is locked. Relax, pal. A guy gets kind of beat looking for a job all day, don't he? Especially when he don't get hired. Okay, so what do you want? They have an offer for him. A simple job and he'll make more than the planet pays him in a year. He knows about all the goings on in the city and can be a great source of information for an organization like theirs. Clark says, okay, I'm interested. Let's go see this organization of yours. These two have been linked to the disappearances of some high-profile people who probably have some high-profile information that certain high-profile countries would pay a high-profile price for. We know these guys are the grunts. We're hoping this little game will lead us to the elites. Clark says, yeah, I have information, but that's not all I can do. There you are, gentlemen. Hey, how did you do? Well, you remember Jimmy Valentine? He was supposed to have super sensitive fingers. He could feel the tumbler slipping into place. Notice he told them how Jimmy Valentine did it. He never said how he did it. Clark is very good at the verbal runaround. Oh, Jimmy who, you ask? I discussed him in Season 2, Episode 2. 
That night, Mr. Thomas Wingate, owner of Wingate Wholesale Jewelers, gets a phone call. There's been a break-in at his office. He better get down there right away. Mr. Wingate? Yes. When Mr. Wingate wakes up, he's thoroughly confused. Easy, Mr. Wingate. You're in good hands. Just take it easy. What? What happened? Where? Where am I? My office phoned and... Don't worry. I'm Stoddard. Federal Bureau of Investigation. You're in the hospital. We've been after a ring of jewel thieves who specialize in uncut diamonds. They're harder to identify than cut gems, of course, and therefore easier to market. His real name was Tristam Coffin. Not only did he have the looks of a major bad guy, he had the name to go with it. He started out doing news and sports casting, but a talent scout couldn't let him keep that face behind a microphone. He put it to good use and most often played a villain like he's doing here. Oh, spoiler, Stoddard is the head villain and they're nowhere near a hospital. His most famous, or should I say infamous, role was a dead body. In 1954, CBS introduced a series called Climax. The show consisted of one-off stories, a different one each week, and it's the show where the very first film adaptation of Casino Royale aired. You know, the one where James Bond was an American who wouldn't know a vodka martini from an Al Martino. Anyway, this particular episode, Dick Powell, who was a major name at the time, was playing a detective investigating a murder. Mr. Coffin was the body lying on the ground with a sheet over him. While the detective and someone else discussed the case, the body thought the scene was over, got up and walked away. By the way, this was live, no retakes. It's one of the most famous scenes in Hollywood history, and it haunted him for the rest of his life. He was never able to shake the title Dead Man Walking, and he hated it. In fact, he claimed it never happened. If you want to see his side of the story, see his IMDb page. But from what I understand, it's on film. I haven't been able to find it, but reputable sources say it happened. I have no reason to believe he's not a reputable source, and he says it didn't. It comes down to who you believe, if you even care. Right now, he's quizzing Wingate about some of those uncut diamonds, specifically the ones in his safe. That's what the attackers were after. The shipment isn't at my office. I have it in my apartment, in a hidden safe I just had put in. Mr. Wingate, you're being pretty careless with the shipment of that value. Those diamonds must be moved to a safer place, and you're in no condition to do it. What's the combination of the safe? I don't know. My wife has it. And she's out of town until Tuesday afternoon, and I can't get in touch with her. All right. Where is the safe? I'll have a man watch it. In the hall linen closet, behind the second shelf. Opening the safe will be where Clark comes in, since Wingate isn't being very cooperative with his thieves. Well, how do you like that? It's amazing. Anyone would fall for that setup and spill everything they knew. And plenty of suckers have fallen for it, Kent. We get a couple of them under lock and key and another... Shut up, Foster. That's what Clark wanted to know. They kidnap people, get them to spill information about their valuables to the FBI, and then lock them up while the grunts go steal the goodies. Sweet operation, except you can't hold these people forever. How long do you intend to hold them? And then what? Well, what do you think, gentlemen? Is Mr. Clark Kent sincere? Does he want to join us? Or a spy on us. Well, supposing I bring you the Wingate stones, will that prove where I stand? Go ahead. And Curtis will go with you. To be sure you don't drop in on the police first. Fair enough. I'm sure he has something in mind, maybe bonk Curtis over the head, and then bring Inspector Henderson back here with a warrant to search the place and put these guys away for multiple kidnappings. Oh, don't, Mr. Kent. You've got to go straight. Don't rub any seats. Miss Lynn and I will stand by you. How long have you been snooping around? Clark, Jimmy followed you from your apartment, then called me. We just got here when they opened the door, but we heard that you... That I was going to pull a job. Well, now Curtis doesn't have to risk getting caught. Your friends are going to stay right here with us, Kent. Sort of uh, hostages, I'd say. Whatever his plan was, it just fell in the door and out the window. Clark leaves and we get a long flight scene. I think we're supposed to get the impression he went a very long way. Well, it's Superman. Oh, you've heard of me then? Heard of you? My dear chap, everyone's heard of you. Though I scarcely ever expected to meet you. My name is Bennett, overseer of the mines here, you know. Nice to meet you, Mr. Bennett. 
Can I offer you a spot of tea? No, thank you. The fact of the matter is I'm in rather a hurry. I'd like to ask a favor, though. I think we're supposed to conclude that he flew to one of the diamond mines in South Africa. He says, I need to borrow some uncut diamonds. British McClimey says he's fresh out. Superman says, how about if I go in and dig some more? May I borrow them? Sir Jolly Good McSpotted Tea says, sure. With the right number and size diamonds, Superman is ready to go deliver them to Stoddard. By way of Clark Kent, of course. You thought I was exaggerating with those names. Clark delivers the diamonds, but while he was gone, Stoddard made a decision. We're pulling out of Metropolis. It's too hot here. You want to come with us? What about them? We can turn loose the people we're already holding. They only saw my secretary, Ann, and myself, and then only under conditions of shock. But your friends here, they've been foolish enough to meet all of us and to sit in on an actual job. We think they should be, shall we say, eliminated. He says, any objections? Clark says, no, the sooner the better. I can't stand to look at him. But he'll have to, at least for a while longer, because Stoddard isn't finished. You're elected to get rid of him. And this time, Curtis will go with you. You tell him he's crazy, Mr. Kent. You're not going to do anything like that, are you? Why not? In the rackets, it's dog eat dog, isn't it? I'll be back and without him. Come on. You had to know that was coming. Clark wants to do it in Perry White's office so he can get a little revenge on his former boss, too. Hold it. Burglar alarm. Perry showed him this a long time ago. Okay, in. He and Curtis tie Lois and Jimmy back to back in a pair of chairs and then Clark goes to work. The plan is pretty simple. Set the chair on fire, it goes up, takes the other chair, the drapes, the desk, the room, and two reporters with it. Curtis is impressed, but back at HQ, Stoddard isn't. In fact, he knows what Clark is up to, but how? Feeling better? I certainly am, thanks to you and your FBI. Now, uh, once again, Mr. White, you're absolutely certain that only you and Clark Kent knew that your firing him was just an act. That's how he pulled his scam on Perry. He found out Perry posted Clark's bail and got suspicious. Kent, this whole setup's phony, Chief. This is the gang. Yes, but I thought I know, you got slugged and you thought the FBI saved you. Yes, and then I went out. You talked, as others have. Meanwhile, remember that burglar alarm that Clark disabled in Perry's office? Yeah, what he did was trip it. Stoddard's secretary calls to tell him the police just rescued Lois and Jimmy and those two know where this place is. Time to skedaddle. Stoddard is just as happy they're not looking at a murder rap, so he'll make Perry and Clark each take a sleeping pill, and as soon as they're out, he and the others will skip town. That shouldn't take more than about 20 minutes, depending on how long ago they ate. Take that. You too. All right, Curtis, get the car. I keep forgetting that TV pills work instantly, and I still want to know why we don't get those kinds of pills. It's a secret plot to make us go crazy from waiting. Somebody call the evening noise news. As quick as they're gone, Clark wakes up and changes. Good thing he brought an extra suit. Sleeping in that one is going to have it all rumpled. <laughs> They always try it. It's not like these guys don't know who Superman is, but they always try it. Superman Chop! The police arrive along with Jimmy and Lois. They want to find Clark. Hmm. Jimmy, Lois, what happened? Found him. Lois teases him a little about being a phony criminal, then Henderson comes in. He has those diamonds that Superman still needs to return, but we'll worry about that off camera. Jimmy wants to know something. 
What if that alarm hadn't gone off? And if the fire had really gotten started in that chair, things could have been pretty hot for us. Clark says, tell him about the chair, Chief. Well, Kent's been ribbing me for a long time about dozing off with a lighted cigar. He said I ought to have a special chair just made for... You mean, so the chair's fireproof? Yeah. The worst that could have happened to them was their clothes smelled like garbage smoke. No, I take that back. The worst that could have happened to them is they liked it. Thanks for watching, kids. And remember, clicking that like button is cool. Subscribing is even cooler. Leaving a comment is as cool as the coolest person you know. And becoming a patron makes you almost just like Superman. So don't hesitate. Do it today. Until next time.